It was a usual evening at the opera. The performances echoed through the halls, yet Box 5 remained silent, almost expectant. And then, as sure as clockwork, the signal. Three knocks. I entered to perform my duties, the air heavy with the sense of an unseen presence. Madame Jules, a footstool, if you please. Of course, Monsieur. And the program for tonight's performance? Yes, the program as well. Here you are, Monsieur Le Fantôme. Will there be anything else? No, thank you, Madame Jules. That will be all. You may leave. Very well, Monsieur. A good evening. Each evening, the same request. The footstool, always rented, a small comfort, meant for the ladies of the audience. Yet he asks for it, this unseen spectre, le fantôme de l'opéra. Into that unfathomable darkness, you stand peering deeply, filled with wonder, fear, and doubt. But something more, an eerie curiosity that beckons you further. I am Reinhard Hendrickson, your guide through this labyrinth of darkness, and I bid you welcome to Zaria Hollow, my home. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring with you, as the mysterious spirits of this place await your presence. In the heart of Paris stood the Palais Garnier, a beacon of artistic splendor and an idol to the grandeur of operatic art. Beneath its gilded facade, this cultural landmark was a complex financial organism, intertwining artistry and fiscal responsibility in an intricate ballet. Tasked with upholding its reputation as a pinnacle of culture and luxury, the management faced the challenge of balancing artistic vision with financial sustainability. Central to this balancing act were the contracts that governed operations. These agreements outlined the clear mandate for those at the helm to maintain its status as the premier lyric stage of France, ensuring luxury, artistic excellence, and cultural prestige. Exploring the costs of running such an establishment reveals that budgets for personnel and materials were substantial. Salaries for the artists, singers, dancers, choir members, and orchestra constituted a significant portion of the expenses. Initially, contracts specified minimum budgets for these groups, but by the late 1870s, a strategic shift occurred, replacing these with minimum salaries for each category. However, the remuneration for star performer was not capped, allowing the venue to attract and retain exceptional talents, artists, who could command significant fees for their unparalleled abilities. Navigating a complex financial landscape, the opera's financial stewards ensured that the delicate ecosystem was balanced. Ticket sales, state subsidies, and performance rights formed the lifeblood of the revenue stream, offsetting the costs of lavish productions and opulent sets. More than just a showcase for world-class performances, this opera house was a microcosm of financial and managerial prowess. A place where the beauty of the arts met the grounded realities of economics. Can you imagine the acumen required to sustain such a cultural citadel? In a realm where light and shadow converge, the concept of blackmail lingered like a formless whisper. For some, it was a veiled ally in a game of unseen stakes. For others, 
a lurking adversary shrouded in ambiguity. Its essence remained a riddle at the crossroads of reality and perception, challenging those it encountered to discern truth from illusion in a world where certainties were as fleeting as the shadows at dusk. So, now let us turn the pages of time, from the tangible to the realm of story, where fact and fiction dance in the moonlight of our imaginations. Let us journey into the world crafted by the masterful Gaston Leroux, where each shadow, each echo, tells a tale more intriguing than the last. Recall our last encounter with the managers of the opera. Monsieur Firmin Richard instructed his secretary. Monsieur Rémy, give box five on the Grand Tier to Messieurs Debienne and Poligny, if it has not already been rented. It had not been. Reservations for the box were sent to them at once. Monsieur de Bienne resided at the corner of the Rue Scribe and the Boulevard des Capuchins. Monsieur Poligny on Rue Aubet. The two letters from the entity known as the Fantôme de l'Opéra had been dropped at the post office on the Boulevard des Capucines. Moncharmin noticed the postmarks when examining the envelopes. There you see, I told you so. They shrugged, remarking on the silliness of men their age, still playing such childish tricks. By the way, they seem quite interested in that young Christine Daae. But which one of them is she mistress to? You know as well as I do that she has a reputation for being virtuous. One's reputations can so often be easily bought and just as easily taken away. For example, I have the reputation of knowing all about music, yet in truth, I do not know the difference between a treble play and a bass clef. Ah, uh, Moncharmin, your celebrated stature in the musical elite, in spite of your rather tuneless endeavors, unmistakably marks you as a masterful lèche -coult. It's a wonder how far one's tongue can carry them when talent falls short. Thereupon, Fermin Richard instructed the attendant to bring in the artists who had been waiting for two hours in the large corridor of the administration, anticipating the manager's office door to open. Behind it awaited fame and fortune, or dismissal. As dawn's first light kissed the ancient stones of the little church in Perogirec, something unusual was discovered. There, at the altar's foot, lay Monsieur Raoul de Chagny, unconscious and alone. How did Raoul, heir to the Chagny fortune, find himself in such a state? What a labyrinth of love led him to this sacred threshold? To fully grasp the unfolding events, it is essential to journey backward in time, to the moments that prelude our current tale. Il était une fois, once upon a time, in the quaint village of Perros Guiret, nestled by the sea, Christine and her father found a sanctuary. Their music, a bridge between heart and the endless horizon, spoke a language of simpler times. Here, where the sea whispers lullabies of the past, I find solace. My father's violin, my voice, their remnants of a childhood untainted by the complexities of the adult world. In these melodies I remain a child, unburdened and free. Little Lottie thought of everything and she thought of nothing. She was often moved to tears. She danced for joy at golden sunsets and wept at the beauty of the moonlight. Christine, my child, Remember the stories I told you about the Angel of Music? Yes, Papa. You said the Angel would come and teach me to sing. That's right. One day, when I'm no longer here, the Angel of Music will watch over you, guide you. Can I see an Angel too, Monsieur Dye? The Angel of Music comes to those with a song in their heart 
and a passion for the melody of life. I will always listen for the angel of music. Papa, I promise. I know you will, my little Lottie. Always keep music in your heart. I will always protect you, Christy. Like the angel of music. Why, thank you, Raoul. I want to always remember this day. Remember, children, music is a sanctuary, a haven for our deepest emotions. Cherish it always. Oh, Christy, the sea is so vast and beautiful here at Paris. Yes, Raoul. It is like a never-ending adventure. Let's build a castle. I'll be the brave knight. And you? You'll be the princess of song. Promise me, Raoul, that no matter where life takes us, we'll always remember this moment. I promise, Christine, forever and always. Let's race to the shore. You're on, Raoul. Catch me if you can. Christine, do you believe in magic? In a music that can enchant the heart? I do, Raoul. And one day, I will sing a song that will enchant. The whole world! Christine! All our memories at Perro, they still live within my heart. Christine's voice, a melody that once spoke of carefree days, now echoes with a depth that stirs something new within me. It's a transition from youthful play to something profound, something that speaks of the future. Once a companion in whimsical adventures now stands before me as a mirror to a world I'm not ready to face. His gestures, once innocent, now carry a weight I'm reluctant to understand. In his eyes, I see a path diverging from the safety of my childhood dreams. Around the fire, under the vast Breton sky, I sense a shift. Christine, the girl I once knew, seems lost in a dance between past and present. My heart reaches out to her, but there's a chasm, widened by the passage of time and the loss of innocence. Time, ever the silent thief, steals away the simplicity of childhood, leaving in its wake the complex hues that become the shades of adulthood. In Peros Girek, Raoul and Christine now stand at the crossroads of change. His word, once a source of joy, now echo with meanings I dare not explore. Raoul, growing into a man with desires and dreams of the future, represents a world that frightens me, a world where I can no longer be the child who sang without care. In her eyes, I see the struggle, a reluctance to step beyond the veil of youth. Christine, my childhood companion, now stands at the threshold, torn between the echoes of the past and the whispers of an uncertain future. As I reach out, my heart heavy with unspoken words, I take her hand. It's a gesture filled with the memories of our shared past, a silent acknowledgement of the bond we've always held. With a reverence born from years of friendship and a deep affection that time cannot erase, I lift her hand to my lips. The brush of a kiss, light but laden with meaning, is my farewell. Mademoiselle, I whisper, my voice barely more than a breath. I shall never, ever forget you. Their parting, marked by Raoul's tender gesture, is a poignant symbol of diverging paths, one moving toward the embrace of adulthood, the other clinging to the remnants of a fading childhood. As Raoul's shadow fades into the distance, I'm left to ponder was my affection for him merely a child's fondness? In his departure, I find myself grappling with a sense of loss, 
not just of Raoul, but of the child I once was. In the commissioner's office, daylight seeps through semi-closed blinds, creating a subdued ambience. Raoul, marked by youthful unease, stands before Commissioner Milfrod's desk. A mix of aged wood and ink aromas fills the air, lending a solemn mood. Milfrod, his visage lined with the marks of time, listens intently, balancing severity and intrigue as Raoul unfolds his story, the room echoing with a hushed intensity. Monsieur le Vicomte, tell me about that night in Perro. Start from the beginning. It all began with a letter from Christine, taking me back to our childhood memories. I thought she still cared. Childhood memories often cloud our judgment. Monsieur le Vicomte, continue please. When I saw her in the dressing room, it was not the first time I had seen her since childhood. I had seen her earlier on stage, when I was in my brother's box at the opera. Although up till that point, we hadn't spoken in years. And your interaction at the opera? She acted as if she didn't know me. I was... confused. And this angel of music she mentioned? Yes, she spoke of an angel visiting her. Teaching her. I heard a voice in her dressing room, but saw no one. Hmm. A voice with no source? Quite peculiar. I thought it was a trick. A deception. Did you confront her about this? I did. I accused her of lying. Of hiding someone. It led to an argument. Monsieur, at your age, an argument is but another form of courtship. Albeit a more turbulent one, I dare say. She claimed I was mad to think she'd be alone with a man, but, Commissioner, I heard that voice clear as day. Intriguing. And after this confrontation? Christine left, overwhelmed. She told me to leave her alone. I, I never imagined it would end like that. Let's go back to the night you were found at the church. What do you remember? I followed Christine to the cemetery. The gate was surprisingly unlocked, and uh, the moonlight was unusually bright, illuminating everything. And in the cemetery, what did you observe? It was empty, or so it seemed. The tombstones were mostly covered in snow, and here, in the heart of this hallowed ground, lies the grave of a soul most dear, the resting place of her father. How many nights has she spent here in solemn vigil, Seeking solace, seeking answers. Among these timeless sentinels, I feel the weight of my own growth. The journey from boyhood to the man I am now. And then, there's Christine. Sweet, innocent Christine. Her spirit seemingly trapped in a perpetual childhood. Her eyes reflecting a world not of this earth. She's like a ghostly melody that haunts these graves. Her purity and naivety untouched by the complexities of the world. It's as though she's lost in a dream. A dream woven from the songs her father played. From the fairy tales and myths that shaped her. In her voice, in her very being, she carries the simplicity of a child. The uncorrupted wonder of a soul that has not been hardened by life's trials. And now, as the solemn chimes of midnight begin to resonate through the stillness of this graveyard, each toll marks not just the passage of time, but the thinning of the veil between two worlds. Then, a remarkable thing occurred. It was the resurrection of Lazarus, a piece that held a special significance. This was the song that her father, now resting beneath the starlit sky, had once played.
In the sudden stillness of the night, there's a subtle shift in the air. Christine, who until now seemed so deeply rooted to this sacred place, suddenly stirs. With a movement as graceful and silent as the falling snow, she turns away from her father's grave. In her movements, there's a delicacy, a fragility that tugs at my heart. It's as if she's a part of this night, a spirit not entirely bound to the world of the living. Her departure is quiet, almost ethereal, like a whisper carried away by the wind. There she goes, walking away from the graves, her silhouette a pale shadow under the moon's glow. Each step she takes seems to deepen the mystery that surrounds her, to weave another layer into the puzzle that is Christine. Part of me yearns to follow, to reach out and bridge the distance that separates us. But another part holds me back, whispering that this moment, this departure, is hers alone. A sacred, solitary journey she must make. Music in a cemetery at midnight? And the resurrection of Lazarus, no less. A symbolic selection under the circumstances. Please, continue. Then I heard a noise from the ossuary. It sounded like chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> a chuckle from the ossuary? Could someone have been hiding there? That's what I thought. I was convinced someone was playing the violin from behind there, manipulating us. Could you discern anything else about this chuckle? Was it mocking? Sorrowful? Perhaps something else? I was transfixed, but then in a blink. First a skull rolled at my feet, then another. It felt like a morbid game. Skulls rolling at your feet in the dead of night. Such an occurrence seems more akin to a gothic tale than reality. Yet the details you provide are strikingly vivid, monsieur. It was as if the skulls were laughing. Laughing skulls, you say? That is indeed a peculiar claim, Monsieur de Chagny. Such phenomena, though hard to fathom, suggest more than mere coincidence or trickery. It seems we are delving into realms beyond the ordinary, where the lines between reality and illusion are strangely blurred. Tell me, were there any other occurrences that night that struck you as out of the ordinary? A shadow slid down the bright wall of the sacristy and entered the church. I followed determined to uncover the truth. In the church, right in front of the high altar, illuminated by the moon through the stained glass, the figure turned. Beneath its cloak, I saw a ghastly death's head, its eyes burning into mine. A death's head in the church? What happened next? I was paralyzed with fear. That's the last thing I remember before losing consciousness. A shadow. Music and an unexplained unconsciousness. This is more than a mere love story. But Monsieur, without evidence, we tread a delicate path in matters such as these, where emotions cloud the air and tangible proof remains elusive. The law's hands are tied. No crime has been committed, at least not one that we can act upon. And for your own well-being, I advise keeping a respectful distance from Mademoiselle Daae. Let cooler heads prevail, and perhaps clarity will follow. It is often wise to step back and observe, especially in matters of the heart intertwined with mystery. The Paris Opera House, a jewel of the Belle Epoque, bustles with the fervor of artistic passion. In the ornate office of Messieurs Richard and Moncharmin, the air is thick with the scent of ink and the rustle of contracts. Among these is the contract of the young and talented Spanish soprano La Carlotta, the talk of Paris, her career intricately managed by her mother, Doña Loreto Garcia. Doña Garcia is quite adamant about the terms for Carlotta's upcoming season. The demands are high. Yet Carlotta's performances are drawing crowds like never before. Indeed, her portrayal in Faust has been nothing short of mesmerizing. We must ensure her continued presence on our stage without overstraining our resources. In the midst of their discussion, 
A novel invention stands in the corner of the room. A prototype telephone, a technological marvel, a bridge to the future, said to be inspired by the works of Edison and gifted to the Paris Opera by Clément Adair. As if responding to their musings, the telephone springs to life. It's a mixture of anticipation and skepticism. Richard answers. Bonjour, ici Monsieur Richard de l'Opéra de Paris. Buenos dias, señores. Doña Loreto Garcia speaking. I am calling to discuss my daughter Carlota's contract terms. Astounding. The clarity is remarkable. Your timing is impeccable, madame. We are currently reviewing Carlotta's contract. Carlotta is a rising star. Her talent and appeal warrant terms that reflect her stature and the prestige she brings to your opera house. Madame Garcia, we understand the importance of Carlotta's career and the joy she brings to our audiences. Rest assured, we are willing to offer her not only the finest stage in Paris, but also additional benefits that will ensure her comfort and success in Madame Garcia. If it would please you and Carlotta, we could also arrange a special celebration in her honor at the charming bistro nearby. A gathering to celebrate her exceptional talent and the wonderful partnership we have forged over the years. It would be a delightful soiree where our patrons, artists and admirers could toast to Carlotta's continued success and artistry. I am pleased with this. However, there is one more little thing. I've noticed the newspapers are favoring this new singer, La Dae. I trust the opera values Carlotta's established excellence over unproven talent. This rivalry with La Dae is becoming the talk of the town. We must tread carefully to maintain harmony within our troupe. Rest assured, Doña Garcia, while we appreciate emerging talents like La Dae, Carlotta's prominence and skill are unparalleled. The press often seeks new sensations, but our patrons know where true artistry lies. Very well. I look forward to receiving your revised proposal. Buen dia, señores. This new era of instant communication is remarkable, yet it brings its own challenges. The rivalry between Carlotta and Ladai is now a matter not just of talent, but of public perception and media intrigue. Indeed, the newspapers are making a feast of this. We must navigate these waters with care. The future of our opera may well depend on how we balance the old guard with the new, the established stars with the rising ones. Please believe that on the evening of January 25th, our two managers exhausted from a day of arguments, intrigue, uh, recommendations, threats, and misunderstandings retired early without so much as a curious peek at box number five. Here is a review I have of that evening from Le Ménestrel. A night of enchantment at the opera. Gounod's Faust. Last evening, the hallowed halls of the Paris Opera House witnessed a performance of Charles Gounod's Faust that shall be etched in the annals of operatic history for times to come. The air was thick with anticipation as the curtain rose, revealing a stage set to transport us into a world of tragic romance and mystic allure. In the role of Marguerite, La Carlotta commanded the stage with a presence that was both regal and tender. Her rendition of L'Air des Bijoux was nothing short of a revelation, each note a sparkling gem in its own right. Her portrayal of innocence seduced by vanity and captivated every soul present 
leaving us spellbound in her tragic journey from purity to despair. But the surprise of the evening was the young Christine Dye in the breeches role of Cybelle. Her performance was a delicate balance of youthful zeal and poignant emotion. In her Felume Aveu, she infused the air with a sweetness that spoke of unrequited love and innocence untarnished by the world's follies. It was a portrayal that tugged at the heartstrings, making one ponder the fates of those who love from the shadow. Carolus Fonta, as Faust, delivered a performance imbued with passion and depth. His portrayal of a man torn between desires and regrets was both powerful and nuanced, captivating the audience with every note. Monsieur Alfred Béard's embodiment of Mephistopheles was a revelation. His commanding stage presence, coupled with a deep resonant voice, perfectly captured the cunning and malevolent nature of his character. Bayard's portrayal was not just sung, but lived, leaving the audience spellbound by his dark charisma. The final trio was a masterful culmination of the evening's emotions. Marguerite's plea, combined with Fonta's torment and Bayard's ominous interjections, created a climax that was both heart-wrenching and sublime. The production showcased the splendor of the Paris Opera, 
with its intricate sets and costumes that effortlessly transported the audience to another era. The orchestra, with its precise and passionate performance, breathed life into Gounod's score. In conclusion, this rendition of Faust was not just an opera, it was a profound journey into the depths of human emotion, a reminder of the power of art to move and transform. The Paris Opera, once again, demonstrated its unparalleled ability to create an artistic experience of the highest caliber. The following morning, Monsieur Richard and Monchamin found in their mail first a thank you card from the Phantom, which read, Listen to this. My dear managers, thank you for the delightful evening. Christine Daae was absolutely exquisite. A word of advice. The choir needs improvement. Regarding La Carlotta, she possesses a splendidly mediocre instrument. I'll be in touch soon regarding the payment of 240,000 francs. To be exact, I require 233,424 francs and 70 centimes. As Monsieur Debienne and Pauligny have already paid me 6,575 francs and 30 centimes, representing my allowance for the first 10 days of this year. Their tenure, as you know, concluded on the evening of the 10th. Yours obediently, FDLO. And another note from Monsieur Debienne and Poligny. Monsieur, we thank you kindly for your friendly gesture. But, but you will easily understand that the prospect of hearing Faust again, however wonderful it may be for the former managing directors of the opera, cannot make us forget that we have no right to occupy box number five on the grand tier, which belongs exclusively to the one we had the opportunity to speak to you about by rereading with you one last time the memorandum book. The letter was accompanied by a small correspondence clip from the Revue Théâtrale, which read, To FDLO, Monsieur R. and Monsieur M.'s behavior is unjustifiable, as we have warned them, and we left your memorandum book in their hands. Salutations. Well, they are really beginning to irritate me with this game. Yes. They are indeed becoming a bore. As Richard and Moncharmin expressed their frustrations, Moncharmin carefully slips Le Fantôme's thank you card into his pocket. You're keeping it, Le Fantôme's card? Yes, for curiosity's sake. It's not every day one receives a note from a ghost, even if it's a prank. That evening, Box 5 on the Grand Tier was rented. Next day, upon arriving in their office, the two managers found an inspector's report relating to the events that had taken place the night before in Box 5. The most important parts of that report. Listen to this incident. I had to request a municipal guard to evacuate Box 5 on the Grand Tier twice tonight, once at the beginning and again in the middle of the second act. The occupants who had arrived at the beginning of the second act were causing a real scandal with their laughter and absurd comments. From all around them, you could hear shush. The audience was starting to protest when the box keeper came to find me. I entered the box and made the necessary admonishments. These people seem not to be in their right mind, making ridiculous remarks. I warned them that if such a scandal happened again, I would be forced to escort them out of the box. It says here one of them was a journalist. Oh no, here comes trouble. He said he would write an article. Good Lord. The journalist's name was Maxime de France. Never heard of him. The other occupants were Monsieur and Madame Darclay and their daughter from Rue de la Paix. The Darclays, but they are incapable of behaving like this. They are very respectable people. What does it all mean? And a Monsieur Malpertuis. Malpertuis? As long as it is not the Malpertuis from the fine arts. Uh, no, no, he would have asked for an armchair or a box. Malpertuis never pays for his seat anywhere. But what if he was the guest of the Darklays? Damn it! 
Monsieur Malpertuis said as he was leaving that he would complain to the managing directors. Send for the inspector. Monsieur Remy, secretary, was 24 years old with a thin moustache, elegant, distinguished, and well-dressed. He wore the appropriate frock coat of the time. Intelligent and timid in the presence of the director, he performed various tasks but primarily acted as gatekeeper to the managerial office. The inspector entered looking a little worried. Tell us what happened. Well, sir, the occupants, they seem more inclined to play pranks than listen to good music. As soon as they arrived and entered the box, they left again and called the box keeper, asking if the box was occupied. And what did the box keeper say? She... she quite simply said that it was Le Fantôme. Fetch the box keeper at once and bring her to me immediately! What the hell is it with the ghost in this opera house? The inspector, unable to speak a word, shook his head vigorously, denying ever having seen the phantom. Very well. What made you say very well like that, Richard? Because I'm going to have everyone who hasn't seen this ghost fired. Since he seems to be everywhere, I cannot have my staff telling me they have not seen him. I like it when my staff actually does their job. The room, still bearing the lingering scent of cigar smoke and the quiet clink of a decanter, now reflects a calmer atmosphere. Richard sits behind his desk, the earlier storm of his emotions now settled into a sea of contemplation. He takes a final contemplative puff of his cigar, the smoke curling upwards in lazy spirals. Remy, Remy, I need you to do something important. Interview the staff, all of them. I want you to find out everything you can about this ghost. Ask detailed questions, document their accounts, I want to know who has seen him, where and when. This is most serious. We need to understand exactly what we're dealing with. Understood, Monsieur Richard. I'll start right away. Do you wish me to include any specific questions? Yes, ask them about any unusual occurrences, strange noises or sightings, and most importantly, any interactions or messages from this so-called phantom. I want a comprehensive report. And Remy, be discreet. We don't want to cause panic or gossip among the staff. This is a serious inquiry, not a bacchanal. Of course, Monsieur Moncharmin, discretion is key. I'll handle it with the utmost care. Good. Report back to us with your findings as soon as possible. It's time we got to the bottom of this. Monsieur Richard seemed immersed in administrative affairs. So the young inspector, hoping to evade notice, edges towards the door. Stay right where you are. In a swift turn of events, Monsieur Remy was dispatched to fetch the box keeper, Madame Giry, known also as the concierge of la rue de Provence. What is your name? Madame Giry, Monsieur le directeur. I am the mother of la petite Giry. Little Meg, surely you know of me. Her response, marked by a coarse formality, momentarily impressed Monsieur Richard. He observed her. The faded shawl, worn shoes, old taffeta dress, and soot-colored hat. Despite her expectation to be known, the managers seemed not to recognize her or her daughter. I don't recall. But tell us, what happened last night in Box 5? I was about to come to you, Monsieur Manager to prevent the same unpleasantness that befell Monsieur de Bienne and Poligny. We only wish to know what happened last night. At this, Madame Giry turned red with indignation, such a tone never before used with her. Seeming ready to depart, but then resuming her seat, she spoke with a gruff voice. It appears that somebody has perturbed Le Fantôme once again. This revelation nearly caused Monsieur Richard to explode, but Montcharmin, more measured, took over the questioning. Madame Giry, could you please tell us what happened? Last night, during Faust, Monsieur Maniera and his party were in Box 5. They had arrived late, 
after the first party had been removed. The young inspector shifted uncomfortably at the mention of this. At any rate, messieurs, during this time a voice whispered in Monsieur Maniera's ear, causing pandemonium in the auditorium. Even Monsieur Isidore Sack broke his leg. Of course it was Le Fantôme's doing. Indeed, really? The ghost broke poor Isidore Sack's leg? Oh, Monsieur, how little you know. Here in a moment, I shall recount the story. In the grand scheme of the opera, every piece plays its part, like the intricate workings of a clock. Monsieur Maniera, the esteemed jeweler, a purveyor of the finest gems that adorn our opera's grandest productions. His connection to the opera house, more than mere commerce, a lifeline of splendor. Shadows of luxury bind him to the opera as tightly as the jewels themselves. Imagine, if you will, the scandal, the sheer disarray that would befall our beloved opera. Should it lose its... What is the word? Ah, uh, yes, its cornerstone of finery. But upon that evening, the opera house resonated with the spellbinding notes of Faust. Mephistopheles was singing... Well, here, let me show you. Ahem. <clears throat> My God, she's gearing up as if she's about to sing the entire <clears throat> opera of Faust by herself. <clears throat> what a delightful spectacle. <clears throat> what a shame Gunnar isn't here to conduct her performance. <clears throat> But perhaps I am boring you, monsieur. No, no, please go on. Oh, please go on. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Well, then. Katerina My dear fellow, witnessing her performing. One might believe we've stumbled into a locomotive disaster rather than an opera. Indeed, Richard, her talents would be far more appreciated under the grand tent of a circus. In box five, Monsieur Maniera, alongside his wife and Monsieur Isidore Sac, was engrossed in the performance. A whisper, almost ethereal, in Monsieur Maniera's right ear. <laughs> <laughs> Maniera turned to his right to see who was speaking to him in that manner, but there was no one. He rubbed his ears as if to say to himself, What was that? Am I dreaming? Shh! Dans les ombres, les vérités se dissimulent. In the shadows, truths are concealed. <laughs> A whisper from Le Fantôme? Precisely, Monsieur Maniera, though unsettled, dismissed it as an illusion. With the progression of the aria, Le Fantôme's voice became more distinct, yet foreboding. Do not trust appearances. A premonition of sorts? Indeed. But Monsieur Maniera remained oblivious to its true meaning. By the third verse, Le Fantôme's message took a sharper edge. Trahison serait, insiste Whisperel sous le masque de l'amitié. Betrayal reveals itself under the mask of friendship. 
Who was that? No, s'il vous plaît. So he was hinting at betrayal? Yes, monsieur. Monsieur Maniera started to feel a, a sense of unease scanning the faces around him. As we reached the climax of the aria, Le Phantom's final whisper was a chilling revelation. Le voile de la trahison sera levé. The veil of betrayal will be lifted. <laughs> and what did Monsieur Maniera see? In a shocking moment of truth, Monsieur Isidore Sack's hand, not just holding, but moving up the skirt of his wife, a clear act of intimate betrayal. orchestrated this exposure? Exactly, monsieur. He brought the hidden truth into the light right there in box five. Overcome with rage, Monsieur Maniera confronted Sack, disrupting the opera in a scandalous spectacle. The phantom revealing such a sordid affair, how scandalous. Yes, monsieur. He has a way of unveiling what lurks in the shadows. Have you spoken to the Phantom yourself, madam? He speaks to me, just as I am speaking to you now. Whenever he visits, he asks for a footstool. It was a usual evening at the opera. The performances echoed through the halls, yet Box 5 remained silent, almost expectant. And then, as sure as clockwork, the signal. Three knocks. I entered to perform my duties, the air heavy with the sense of an unseen presence. Madame Jules, a footstool, if you please. Of course, Monsieur. And the program for tonight's performance? Yes, the program as well. Here you are, Monsieur Le Fantôme. Will there be anything else? No, thank you, Madame Jules. That will be all. You may leave. Very well, Monsieur. A good evening. Each evening, the same request. The footstool, always rented. A small comfort, meant for the ladies of the audience. Yet he asks for it. This unseen spectre. Le Fantôme de l'Opéra. <laughs> Can you believe this, Richard? <laughs> A footstool. Instead of laughing, you should heed my warning. Monsieur de Bienne and Poligny found out the hard way, but... Found out what? It was during La Juive. Monsieur Poligny wanted to sit alone in the Phantom's box. Mademoiselle Krauss was singing La Machine. At that moment, Monsieur Poligny suddenly stood up, walking rigidly like a statue. I asked him where he was going. 
But he did not answer, looking paler than death. And the footstool? How does that relate to the phantom? Ever since that night, we left Le Loge du Fantôme alone. And no one disputed that it's his box. When he comes, he asks for his footstool. It's as simple as that, monsieur. And the box to the right of box five, was it occupied? No, monsieur. Both box seven and box three were empty. The performance had just begun. A footstool? Does the ghost have a wife? Sometimes I find flowers or a fan in my box, left by the phantom. Or his lady, perhaps. Once I even returned a fan they had left behind. Le Phantom. He's generous. He leaves 40 sous, sometimes a hundred, or even ten francs after performances. Sometimes a box of English sweets that I'm ever so fond of. But ever since they started disturbing him again, he hasn't given me anything. And how does he give you this money? He leaves it on the shelf in the box, along with the program. Madame, Giri, you haven't observed the regulations. I will have to fine you. Shut up, you imbecile. You may go now, Madame Giri. I want that mad woman fired! Within the opera's heart, a chilling journey unfolds. Richard and Montchamin, driven by a mix of curiosity and dread, step towards Box 5. The stage, left in disarray, transforms before them into the deck of a spectral ship, with rigging and set pieces casting ominous, twisting shadows. The canvas-covered orchestra seats undulate eerily, resembling a petrified sea. Richard and Montchamin, like lost souls aboard a cursed vessel, navigate this silent, unnerving scene. Columns rise like the masts of this doomed ship. Balconies loom overhead like cliffs on a forsaken coast. Above, faces carved in stone, seemingly animated by the play of light and shadow, appear to whisper and laugh, mocking their quest with ghostly murmurs. In this oppressive silence, their minds race, hearts thudding in their chests. The dim spectral light weaves a tapestry of fear, blurring the line between reality and nightmare. A skull there in the shadows, grinning a macabre sentinel watching us. This place, it, it's alive with phantoms. I feel its cold, unyielding gaze, a harbinger of doom. And there, um, a, a, an apparition in the gloom, an, an old woman, the likeness to Madame Giry is striking yet twisted into something sinister. Are we mere puppets in a ghostly play, our strings pulled by unseen, malevolent hands? Inside, quickly. They search the box, their forced laughter echoing hollowly in the oppressive air, a vain attempt to dispel the growing sense of unease. Chairs, upholstery, tapestries, all ordinary, yet each item seems imbued with a lingering, malevolent presence. Mon Charmant, we must confront this head-on this Saturday here in Box 5. We'll face whatever haunts this place. We'll witness Faust and perhaps confront the specters that lurk behind these cursed curtains. The mystery of Box 5 with its whispered secrets and lurking shadows, beckons them back into its eerie, haunted embrace. The Place de l'Opéra, along the Rue Scrib, Amidst the grandeur of old Paris, a discreet rendezvous unfolds. Our secretary, Monsieur Rémy, finds unlikely counsel in the shadows of the opera. Ah, Monsieur Rémy, a fine morning for mysteries, isn't it? Indeed, Monsieur Fonta. It's, uh, well, uh, uh, hop. news does travel fast. It's quite a task. I have, um, been given 
The ghost, eh? A riddle wrapped in the heart of the opera. Not an easy one, that. Precisely. I'm not sure where to begin. The inspector's dismissal weighs heavily on me. Worry not, my friend. The opera is a world of many layers. You might start by peeling back the simplest. Consider Madame Giry. A mere box keeper, you might think, but in the opera, even the humblest role holds its secrets. I could introduce you to her. Mother's quite the treasure trove of opera lore. That would be invaluable, Mademoiselle Giry. Thank you. Don't forget us, the artists. We've seen things on and off stage that might intrigue you. And those stagehands moving like ghosts themselves. They see all, yet say little. Time for me to pirouette away. Monsieur Remy, we shall speak soon. I'll follow every lead. Thank you, all of you. And so, under the watchful eyes of the Opera Garnier, our secretary embarks on a journey through veils of secrets and whispers of the past. In the pursuit of truth, the lines between the seen and unseen blur, just as they do in the winding Rue Scribe. At a quaint café near the Opera, the morning sun filters through the leaves, casting dappled light over a small table where the dismissed inspector sits, lost in thought. Monsieur Remy approaches with a tentative step. May I join you, Inspector? Of course, Monsieur Remy. Just reflecting on my rather abrupt change in career path. It's a pity, really. The opera won't be quite the same. Indeed. I've always loved the opera, you know? As a young man, I dreamt of being on that stage, but life had other plans. The police academy for me. My baritone, well, it's more suited for off-hours crooning than grand operas. My mother thought I'd make a fine detective, not a performer. Ha! Huh. A baritone and a detective? Imagine the headlines, The Singing Sleuth Solved the Case. Ha ha! Now that would be something. Alas, my stage is crime scenes, not the grand operas. But who says your time with the opera has to end? Maybe there's a role yet for you? Monsieur Remy, do go on. An unofficial investigation. The opera is ripe with secrets. And who better to explore them than someone who knows both the law and loves the arts? A detective in the wings. An intriguing notion. Precisely. We could unravel this mystery together. After all, every enigma has its key. You have my attention, Monsieur Remy, and perhaps my assistance. Monsieur, I've heard intriguing stories about Gunod's Faust and its connection to Le Fantôme. Could you enlighten me? Ah, Monsieur Remy, you've stumbled upon one of the most fascinating tales of the opera. Gounod initially composed Faust for the Théâtre Lyrique, and it was quite different from what we know today. The original score was far more extensive. See here, this is the original score. Notice the differences in composition. Gounod was a master of lyrical melodies, yet he faced challenges adapting Faust for the grand stage of the Opera Garnier. And the story of the red ink corrections? Ah, the red ink. It's said that during a night of exhaustive work, Gounod fell asleep here at this desk. When he awoke, he found his score revised, alterations and suggestions marked in red ink. The mystery deepens as no one knew who made these changes. And did Gounod accept these mysterious changes? Not only did he accept them, but he also embraced them. It's believed that Gounod found the revision so insightful that he incorporated them into the final version. The changes enhanced the dramatic flow and emotional depth of the opera, making Faust the masterpiece it is today. So, Le Fantôme wasn't just a spectral presence, but a guiding force in the artistic process. Remarkable. Indeed, Monsieur. The story of Faust and its transformation is just more evidence to the unseen influences that shape art. Whether it was Le Fantôme or a stroke of unseen genius, the mystery adds to the opera's enchantment. And what about Christine Daae? How does she fit into this narrative? Ah, Christine Daae. Her performance as Marguerite was indeed a revelation. 
Guno himself was taken aback by her performance. He recently said that without the success brought on by those mysterious changes to the score, he might never have had the fortune to witness Miss Daae embody the essence of Marguerite so completely. So, it seems Le Fantôme's influence extends beyond the music to the very soul of the performances on stage? Oh, Monsieur Rémy, you've been asked to inquire by the management of this opera house, and I must say, it's a subject that's been gnawing at me for years. You see, the Opera Garnier, though a marvel in its own right, is not the only opera house in Paris. There's a whole history, a legacy of art and culture, tied to the very heart of this city. And I dare say the management has been the wrong sort for far too long. Monsieur Rémy, the tale of our opera is a complex one burdened by years of misguided management. Yet in these halls, there is one who truly understands the essence of our art, Le Fantôme. He may be a shadow to some, but to me, he embodies what this opera should be. Mysterious, enthralling, a guardian of true artistry. The managers? They're mere players in a facade of misdirection, prioritizing wealth over the purity of opera. If Le Fantôme were at the helm, the renaissance of artistry we would witness. He's the key to reviving the spirit of this opera, a spirit that's been stifled under the current regime. Le Fantôme is more than a spirit in this building. He's the soul of the Paris Opera Company itself. His influence has been a constant, a guiding force from the Théâtre Lyrique to our present Garnier. He is truly Le Fantôme, de l'Opéra de Paris lui-même, the phantom of the Paris Opéra itself shaping our destiny with unseen yet tender hands. I've been exploring the influence of Le Fantôme across the opera. As stage manager, how do you perceive his presence here? Ah, Monsieur Rémy. You know, in a place like this, filled with artists and dreamers, you need a bit of practicality to keep things running. And believe it or not, Le Fantôme plays a part in that too. It's not all notes on music and costumes, Sometimes it's about the nuts and bolts of running a show. Take, for example, the incident during Faust rehearsals last season. A crucial piece of stage machinery malfunctioned during a rehearsal, and it could have been disastrous. But mysteriously, the issue resolved itself overnight. The next morning, we found a note, presumably from Le Fantôme, detailing exactly what had gone wrong and how to fix it. It was technical, precise, and incredibly helpful. And it's not just the big things. There have been countless little instances where something just works out almost magically. A door that wouldn't lock suddenly secures itself. Lights that flicker steadying just before a performance. I don't know if it's him, but it makes you wonder. You might not see him, but you feel his presence, a guiding hand ensuring that the show goes on as it must. Mademoiselle, may I have a moment? I'm gathering insights about Le Fantôme's influence in the opera. Le Fantôme? Oh, Monsieur Remy. Where do I begin? In the world of dance, we are always reaching for perfection. And in this pursuit, Le Fantôme has been an unseen force that somehow elevates our performances. There are moments on stage under the bright lights when you feel a presence, it's as if Le Fantôme is right there with you, guiding your steps, lifting your spirit. Thank you, Mademoiselle. Monsieur, can you tell me about what happened to you that night? Monsieur Remy, I'll never forget that night. I was working late. I had walked across the stage and suddenly I fell through an open trap door as I was bracing for the impact. I thought for sure I would hit the ground. But then something incredible happened. What happened? Just as I thought for sure, I would hit the ground. I felt arms, or what seemed like arms. Something caught me. It was a shadow. A shadow saved you? Yes, and I am certain it was the Phantom. After catching me, the shadow gently set me down. I was unharmed. You were unharmed? Oui, monsieur. I was now in the depths of the dark opera, lost and frankly terrified. But the shadow never left me. It guided me out through the cellars. A living presence, 
leading me back to safety. Incredible. If it wasn't for Lothanto, I could have died or broken my neck or be lost forever in those cellars. I was terrified, of course, uh, but also overwhelmed with gratitude. After that night, I knew that Lafontaine wasn't just a tale. He's a guardian, a protector of those who work here. They should pay him to keep people out of the cellars. Well, they bloody well should. That's a remarkable story. It adds a profound dimension to the legend of Le Fantôme. Madame Giry, a word if you please. I find myself in need of your unique perspective. Oui, monsieur. Oh, monsieur Remy, this is unexpected. Usually the management has little need for the likes of me. How can I help you, monsieur? Madame Giry, it's about Le Fantôme. Le Fantôme? And why does someone like you, Monsieur Remy, seek information about him? The managers don't usually entertain such legends. I'm aware of the manager's stance, but this isn't about them. It's my own inquiry. There are things happening in this opera house that need answers. I believe you can shed light on Le Fantôme's existence and activities. Very well, Monsieur. But this isn't a discussion for the corridors. Come. Let's find somewhere more quiet. I remember the first time I truly sat and listened to an opera at the Garnier. It was during a performance of Faust, a night that remains etched in my memory like a precious gem. The corridors of the opera were alive with the usual hustle and bustle. The soft murmur of the audience blending with the distant strains of Gounod's masterpiece. As I entered Box 5, my usual round of duties weighing heavy on my mind, the persistent ache of sciatica made its presence known, a relentless reminder of the demands of my position. Une autre soirée chargée, cette sciatique me tourmente sans cesse, I muttered to myself trying to steel myself against the pain that threatened to overshadow the evening's performance. That's when Le Fantôme spoke. Madame Jules, you push yourself too hard. Please sit down and rest for a moment. He urged, his voice a soothing balm to my wearied soul. I hesitated, acutely aware of the impropriety of an usher occupying a patron seat. Mais, monsieur... Uh, ce n'est pas convenable. Une ouvreuse dans le fauteuil d'un spectateur. I protested weakly. But his firm tone left no room for argument. Asseyez-vous. Maintenant. Reluctantly, I took a seat. The plush velvet of the chair offering a stark contrast to the hard wooden benches I was here accustomed to during my rounds. The opera continued in the background the familiar music reaching me in a way it hadn't in years, as if it flowed through my very veins, rekindling the passion for the art that had brought me to the Opera Garnier in the first place. As Le Fantôme and I engaged in conversation, I found myself immersed in the performance, seeing and hearing Faust, as if for the first time. The pain that had been my constant companion, my uninvited guest, faded into the background, replaced by the sheer beauty and profound emotion of the music and the narrative unfolding before me. That evening, as I reluctantly bid farewell to my newfound sanctuary and return to my duties, I carried with me a renewed appreciation for the art that I had been a part of for so long. It was a rare gift. The encounter with Le Fantôme had transformed a mundane evening into a cherished memory, and I knew that the echoes of that night would forever resonate within me, inspiring my continued dedication to the grandeur of the opera. Thank you, Madame Giry. Je vous verrai plus tard. Merci encore, Madame. As I traverse these halls, the essence of Le Fantôme reveals itself not merely as a whisper in the shadows, but as the very soul of our beloved opera. 
Like Balzac's unknown masterpiece, he is a presence felt but unseen, shaping our destinies from beyond the veil of the mundane. But how to convey this delicate tapestry of thought to Monsieur Montcharmon and Richard? Would they appreciate the nuanced ballet of ideas or find themselves adrift in a sea of abstraction? To say, gentlemen, our opera is not haunted by a mere ghost, but guided by a spirit akin to the muses that whispered to Homer by the shores of the wine-dark sea would likely provoke more confusion than enlightenment. And yet, is there not a touch of Voltaire's wit in attempting to illuminate the shadows with the lamp of reason, however dim it may seem in the face of such ethereal mysteries? On a somber Saturday morning at the Paris Opera House, the managing directors, Richard and Montchamin, faced a perplexing challenge as they encountered a mysterious letter from the elusive FDLO. My dear managing directors, so it is to be war. Here is my ultimatum. What is this? Montchamon, have you heard of such audacity? Let me see. Demanding his private box. Insisting on Christine Daae singing tonight. Can you believe this? Deliver the envelope containing my allowance to Madame Giry. Ha <laughs> ha! It's preposterous. I wonder, could uh, Montcharmin be behind this? No, he couldn't have. It's too brazen even for him. And this threat of a curse, the gall of it. Whoever this phantom thinks he is, he is playing a dangerous game. Richard's bluster seems genuine, but could he be orchestrating this charade? The timing is uncanny. This mention of Madame Giry, it's peculiar. Richard, have you noticed anything unusual about her lately? Montchamin's suspicion of Madame Giry is nothing more than a clever diversion. The but is he the mastermind or another pawn in this game? This phantom is toying with us. Messieurs, I apologize for the disturbance, but Monsieur Lachenal, the stable master, insists on speaking with you immediately. He seems quite distressed. La Chanel! Who the hell is that? Send him in, Remy. Perhaps he can shed light on this day's absurdities. Monsieur La Chanel, the senior stableman of the opera, was a man marked by the years of his service as much as by the lines of concern etched upon his brow. His moustache, meticulously groomed, seemed almost a separate entity, giving him a dignified air amidst the equine scents and hay. His eyes, sharp as a hawk's, missed nothing. No misplaced tack, no flicker of equine distress. Yet, beneath the surface, one could discern a tremor of unease, as if he were haunted. Within his restless air, there was a blend of indignation and the peculiar resignation of a man who had seen the extraordinary become commonplace within the storied walls of the Opera Garnier. Bonjour, Monsieur Lachenal. To what do we owe this visit? Monsieur, I implore you to dismiss the entire stable. I didn't even know we had a stable. You want to get rid of our horses? Not the horses, Monsieur. The stablemen. How many stablemen do you have? Six, Monsieur. Six stablemen? That's at least two too many. Actually, Monsieur, we now only have eleven horses. But I was informed that we possessed a dozen horses. We did possess twelve horses until the unfortunate theft of César, the distinguished white steed from La Prophète. César has been pilfered? This is a grave matter. Indeed, Monsieur. César is a singular equine, unparalleled in his splendor. Having toiled with Franconi for a decade, I can affirm his exceptional nature. And now he has been snatched away. How could such an audacious theft occur under your watch, especially with our heightened security? It remains a perplexing enigma, monsieur. Whispers abound among the stablemen, some implicating the extra hands, 
while others lay blame upon the doorman, an employee of the administrator. The doorman, his character has always been beyond reproach. But surely you must have an idea, Monsieur Lachanel. Indeed, Monsieur. I harbor suspicions. I firmly believe it was the handiwork of the Phantom of the Opera. The Phantom? You believe in him too? Allow me to recount what I beheld. I witnessed, with my own eyes, a shadowy figure astride a white horse, a perfect likeness of César. They both disappeared into the underground gallery. They disappeared, just like that, the ghost and the horse? And yet, you did not pursue them, this L'étrange duo? I gave chase, I called out to them, but they vanished into a solid wall. Enough, Monsieur Lachenal. Your testimony troubles us, and we shall take appropriate action. We will lodge a complaint against the Phantom. And what of the remaining members of the stable, Monsieur? Understood, we will look into that too. You may take your leave now, Monsieur Lachenal. We appreciate your vigilance. Merci, Monsieur. Remy, I want Lachenel fired immediately. His incompetence cannot be tolerated. But, Monsieur, he's a friend of the government commissioner. Firing him might attract unwanted attention from the press. Yes, and imagine the headlines. Opera managers fire phantom accuser. We'd become the laughingstock of Paris. And he's well-connected in society. If he speaks of the phantom, it could become a scandal. Then let's keep this quiet. The opera must maintain its dignity. In the manager's office, where decisions ripple through the opera house, the clock's chime marks a moment of drastic change. Pardonnez-moi, messieurs. A letter from Le Fantôme. He insists it's urgent. That we have matters to discuss. Her message, however, is cut short by Furman Richard's expression. That is it! I have had enough of this. Monsieur, please. Please, he told me to come. Le Fantôme told me to come. Because of your involvement with this so-called Phantom, engaging in blackmail, theft, and undermining the dignity of this opera house, you are fired. Fired? I will hear no more of the Phantom nonsense. I was only following instruction. Your involvement with these theatrics has gone far enough. Monsieur, please, I'm innocent. Richard, this seems rather hasty. Shut up, you nincompoop. Please, please, I'm begging you. You must believe me. Richard's hands seize Madame Giry. This isn't right. Her world spinning into chaos. I didn't do anything. Madame. Unhand me. Get out, inspectors. And for your crimes, Madame Giry, <laughs> I'm having you arrested. Utterly incensed, Madame Giry strikes Monsieur Richard over the head with her umbrella. Ah! Her dignity, woven through years of service, now lay trampled underfoot, much like a taffeta skirt. Oui, oui monsieur. monsieur. Inspectors, arrest her! Please! Richard! Even Remy tried, but it was no use. Please! No! Come along quietly now. In the hallway, her protests echo. <laughs> A crescendo of injustice filling the opera house. The chorus boys, silent witnesses to the harsh treatment of an innocent woman. Comprenez, Monsieur l'inspecteur, il appartenait à une société occulte. Il était contre moi parce que That's enough from you. <laughs> On the street, her cries pierce the night, magnified by the Opera House's silent gaze. That was rather extreme, don't you think? Indeed. This will bring only more trouble. We should let her daughter know about this. Her daughter? Which one was she? Meg Siri. The ballerina, Madame Giry's daughter. She deserves to know what's just happened to her mother. Ah, yes, Meg Giry. Of course, that's the right thing to do. Will you go do it, Remy? As night falls, the little rats of the ballet 
led by Little Meg, gather. Clutching their small savings, they unite to bail out the opera's beloved Madame Giry from an unjust fate. In the heart of Paris, the first light of day illuminates the window of La Carlotta's residence on Rue du Faubourg Saint-Honoré. Inside, the famed opera singer awakens, unaware of the ominous message that awaits her. Good morning, Mademoiselle Carlotta. Your mail as requested. Carlotta, still in her morning robe, takes the letters with a nonchalant air. Bonjour. Uh, what's this? An anonymous letter? She reads the letter with growing concern. If you sing tonight, be prepared for a great misfortune. For, at the very moment you sing, it will befall you. A misfortune worse than death. No breakfast. I can't... Not after this. The letter scrawled in hasty, shaky red ink, foretold a dire warning. The once hungry diva sat in deep contemplation, pondering over her unseen adversary. I will not be intimidated, but who could be behind this? Within La Calotta, the diva of the Paris Opera, there lies a turmoil that glistens less than the jewels around her neck. Calotta, draped in her own vanity, often dances with shadows of doubt that echo through the chambers of her mind. Ah, Carlotta, pride and artistry blend in you like oil and water, never quite mixing, always at odds. In your mirror, you see not yourself, but a reflection marred by the specter of inadequacy, a specter that whispers tales of a younger, perhaps more radiant voice rising in the wings. Today, the diva finds herself wrestling with a new adversary, not of flesh and blood, but of ink and threat. The letter a warrant of doom, perhaps, or merely a phantom of her own making, a product of the paranoia that festers in the heart of one so consumed by her own image. Does she hear them? The voices that gnaw at the edges of her reality blurring the line between grandeur and madness. They murmur of betrayal, of shadows, clad in the guise of a young siren named Christine. They coil around her thoughts, tightening like a noose. And there, in the midst of her gilded cage, the diva falters. The voices, oh, how they jeer and jab, pushing her to the brink. And so, in a desperate bid for solace, for a respite from her own echoing doubts, she calls out, not for a lover, not for an admirer, but for the one constant in her tumultuous life. Mama, mama, por favor, ven aquí. Mama, mama, por favor, ven aquí. Estoy asustada. Hay algo terrible en esta carta. Necesito que estés conmigo. No sé qué hacer. In the end, beneath the grandeur and the applause, beneath the layers of self-constructed grandiosity, Carlotta remains at her core a daughter seeking refuge in her mother's arms from the tempest of her own creation. In a separate room, Doña Loreto Garcia, startled by the urgency in her daughter's voice, quickly sets aside her activity. She stands up quickly from her chair, her expression a mixture of concern and maternal instinct. Carlotta's mother's heart swells with worry. Her swift steps reflect the seriousness of the situation as she approaches her daughter's room. Carlota, ¿qué pasa, mi niña? What has frightened you so? Mama, this letter, it speaks of a curse if I perform tonight. Carlota, visibly shaken, holds out the letter to her mother who takes the letter. Doña Loreto's eyes, scanning the words briefly before she looks up to meet her daughter's anxious gaze. 
Let not such cowardly threats sway you. Remember, we have secured your position with the managers. Your talent shall not be overshadowed. Little did she know the plot against her was of her own making, a bitter vendetta against the young Christine who had outshone her on stage. Christine Day, my rival. We must not allow her rise to diminish your light. We've worked too hard for this. Maybe you should step out onto the balcony, get some fresh air to clear your mind. Carlotta, still fuming, but recognizing the wisdom in her mother's suggestion, steps out onto the balcony. As Carlotta steps out onto her balcony, her eyes are drawn to a sight most unusual and unsettling. Below, a horse-drawn hearse, draped in black, stands solemnly. The horses statuesque seem to sense the gravity of their burden. The hearse, an archaic symbol of mortality, appears out of place amidst the waking life of Paris. The black crepe, non-reflective and solemn, shrouds the hearse, a tradition meant to guide spirits away from the mortal realm. Its presence beneath Carlotta's window is not just a mere coincidence, but a dark omen, a harbinger perhaps, of the misfortune foretold in her letter. Una carroza fúnebre, a esta hora, bajo mi propia ventana, un oscuro presagio. In that moment, the gravity of the situation begins to dawn on Carlotta. The threat in the letter, now seemingly personified by the hearse's grim presence, ignites a spark of fear in her heart. Yet, amidst the fear, her resolve hardens. She will not be intimidated, not by anonymous letters, nor by omens of death. Mi querida Carlotta, ah. superstitions be damned. Rally your supporters, all your admirers and amigos, Remember, mi niña, that despicable Canala Moncharmin offered to host a gathering for you at the bistro. Perhaps now's the time to cash in on that favor. In the shadow of the Grand Opera House, within the walls of a select Parisian bistro, a gathering of distinction was underway. Here, in this bastion of culture and refinement, La Carlotta's most devoted admirers and influential patrons had assembled. They were the creme de la creme of Parisian society, united by their adoration for the city's prima donna. Into this enclave of veneration stepped La Carlotta. Her presence, as arresting as her voice, stilled the air itself. Her hair, a cascade of auburn locks, crowned with a fiery bloom, framed her face in regal splendor. Her eyes, deep with the complexities of art and passion, swept over her select audience, each one a connoisseur of her unparalleled talent. Esteemed patrons, we gather today not just to celebrate a voice, but to honor the spirit of our great opera. La Carlota, our diva, our heart. My esteemed friends, an opera without its heart is like a night without stars. You have been my steadfast companions through every crescendo and every silence. Yet now, our beloved opera whispers of mysteries and shadows rather than the purity of art. Adorned in a gown that mirrored the lush gardens of Versailles, La Carlotta was a vision of elegance and determination. The necklace at her throat, a constellation of gold and gems, symbolized the enduring radiance of her art. Brava, La Carlotta, the star of Paris. Thank you, Miss Amigos. Tonight the I am to sing Paris. Marguerite in Faust. Yet dark omens cast a shadow over this joy. Dark omens, Carlotta? What do you mean? I've received threatening notes, escritas in blood-red ink, warning of disaster if I perform tonight. They are from Le Fantôme de l'Opera. Someone seeks to unseat me from my rightful stage. A threat to you, our prima donna? This is scandalous. But let them not forget. Yo soy La Carlotta, the prima donna of Paris. 
No Phantasma, no rival, nothing can quench my talent. My voice will triumph over these threats. Your voice is the soul of Paris, Carlotta. We stand with you. La Carlotta, the sovereign of song, stood not merely as a performer, but as an emblem of resilience. Her every word was a clarion call, a challenge to the shadows that dared to encroach upon her domain. Carlota, recuerda quien eres. Do not let these shadows dim your light. Tonight, I am pleased you all are here to support me. For even if I were dying, I'll sing the role of Marguerite. Amidst the roars of support from her most devoted followers, La Carlota stood defiant. A complex figure of ambition, fear, and defiance. The grand foyer of the Paris Opera House is a spectacle of opulence and grandeur, a fitting prelude to the night's anticipated performance. As the creme de la creme of Parisian society gathers in this magnificent space, the air is thick with anticipation, mingled with the heady scent of perfume and the soft rustle of silk and taffeta. The vast expanse of the foyer with its soaring ceilings adorned with intricate frescoes and sparkling chandeliers bathes the assembled elite in a warm, golden light. Financiers in their finest attire engage in animated discussions, their conversations peppered with the latest economic forecasts and business ventures, their laughter echoing off the marble walls. Journalists with keen eyes and sharper pens move through the crowd, gathering tidbits of gossip and speculation, their presence a subtle reminder of the power of the press amidst the opulence. Bureaucrats, the stewards of the city's affairs, stand in clusters. Their discourse, a blend of political maneuverings and social niceties, a dance as choreographed as any ballet to be performed on stage. Amidst this whirl of activity, the patrons of the arts, adorned in jewels and finery, share their excitement for the evening's opera. The allure of Gounod's Faust has drawn them here, but it is the intricate ballet of social interactions that holds their attention in the moments before the curtain rises. Nestled in a sumptuous box, not far from the grand enclosure once meant for Napoleon Bonaparte, a distinguished group of La Carlotta's fervent admirers convenes, basking in the shared glow of their anticipation for the evening's performance. The lavish setting, adorned with plush velvet and the soft gleam of gaslit chandeliers, casts an air of opulence and exclusivity around them. Among this select gathering are Gérard, a patron of the arts, known for his keen insight and steadfast loyalty to Carlotta, and Isabel, an elegant aficionado with a deep appreciation for the opera's grand diva. Joining them are Elias, a discerning guest from Austria, with a penchant for the Parisian opera scene, and Litzi, an elderly dame whose presence is as much a fixture of the opera as the velvet curtains themselves, known for never missing a performance. Isabel, 
Have you caught wind of the murmurs? They say there's a plot afoot aimed squarely at our Carlotta. Indeed, Gerard. The rumor mill has been unusually active. They speak of underhanded schemes and shadowy figures conspiring. It's all rather unsettling, especially on a night like this. Nonsense and folly. Who would dare challenge the reign of our diva? La Carlota's talent is unparalleled, her voice a beacon that outshines all others. Ah, uh, but the opera is a garden of intrigue, Gerard. Have you not heard the whispers about young Christine Day? They say she has caught the eye of someone influential, someone who could change her fortunes overnight. Christine Daae, preposterous. No matter who backs her, she could never hold a candle to Carlotta. Our diva's brilliance cannot be dimmed by such an unseasoned talent. Perhaps, but the heart of the opera is fickle, and audiences crave novelty. Christine's innocence and raw talent could prove to be a potent mix especially if there are powerful forces at play behind the scenes. Then it falls upon us to ensure that Carlotta's star remains the brightest in the opera sky. We must stand by her, come what may, and shield her from these petty machinations. Ever the knight in shining armor, Gerard. Very well, we shall lend our support to Carlotta, as we always have. But let us not dismiss the unfolding drama too hastily. The opera, after all, is as much about the spectacle off stage as it is about the performance on stage. Indeed, let the games begin. Tonight we watch not only Guno's masterpiece, but also the subtle play of power and ambition within these hallowed walls. The group settle back into their seats, their attention now riveted to the stage below their minds alight with the complexities of the night ahead. The opera opens with the aged philosopher Dr. Johann Faust, disillusioned by the futility of life and the emptiness of earthly knowledge and pleasures. In his despair, he contemplates suicide, but is halted by the sounds of the outside world, the laughter of youth and the hymns of the faithful, which only deepen his bitterness, which culminates with Faust summoning the powers of darkness. As the opera unfolds on the grand stage, we see Monsieur Carolus Fonta embodying the tormented soul of Faust, his performance radiating the profound despair and longing of the character. The dimly lit study, with its aura of faded grandeur and intellectual pursuit, serves as the perfect backdrop for Fonta's portrayal of a man on the brink of forsaking his lifelong quest for knowledge in exchange for a momentary taste of youth and pleasure.
the pivotal moment arrives with an electrifying intensity when Monsieur Alfred Bayard, as Mephistopheles Le Diable, makes his grand entrance. Together, Fonta and Bayard create a compelling dynamic, the palpable tension between them mirroring the eternal struggle between good and evil, desire and morality. Their interaction is a dance of temptation and resistance, masterfully executed to the hauntingly beautiful score that underscores the gravity of Faust's dilemma. Monsieur Richard and Monsieur Moncharmin are seated in box five overlooking the audience with a mix of amusement and anticipation. The final notes of the first act linger in the air. And that's one act down without any sign of our opera's infamous ghost. Yes, it seems the Phantom is unusually tardy this evening. Suddenly the atmosphere shifts as Monsieur Rémy approaches discreetly, handing them an elegant, ominous-looking card. Monsieur Monchamin's expression changes from amusement to concern as he reads the message aloud. Sachez, messieurs, ceci est une déclaration de guerre. Messieurs, beware. This, This means war. The two exchange a look of understanding, their earlier levity replaced by a sense of foreboding and urgency. Le fantôme, he's making his move. As they contemplate the gravity of the message, the door to their box swings open abruptly, revealing the flustered stage manager. Monsieur, urgent news. It seems there's a plot brewing against La Carlotta. She's in a fury. What a night of surprises this is turning out to be. Come along, Richard. We must go see what's happening backstage. The dressing room is crowded, buzzing with the energy of friends and colleagues. Amidst the hubbub, La Carlotta is the focal point, her voice dominating the room as she vehemently expresses her displeasure. And this day thinking she can overshadow me? Never! Madam, your passion for the stage is unrivaled. But we hear rumors of discord. Can we count on your performance tonight? I am the soul of this opera, monsieur. My voice shall not falter, despite the conspiracies and shadows that lurk within these walls. We value your artistry, Madam Carlotta. It is your soulful rendition that captivates the audience not just the power of your voice. La Calotta, momentarily pacified, nods. She then hands them a sealed envelope, her expression a mix of concern and defiance, the red ink all too clear. F, D, L, O, God damn it. The mention of F, D, L, O casts a shadow over the room, the air thick with unspoken fears. What does it all mean? Tell me! Richard and Moncharmin exchange a look, the weight of the situation clear between them. They choose not to reveal the contents of the message. Fear not, madame. We shall handle this matter. Your focus must remain on tonight's performance. They exit the room, leaving a trail of whispered speculations and heightened curiosity. La Carlotta is left staring after them, a mix of frustration and resolve on her face. Phantasma or no Phantasma, the stage is mine tonight. La Carlotta, an unparalleled talent, yet an instrument with strings unattached to the heart, a voice that could traverse the compositions of German, Italian and French maestros without faltering, flawless, powerful, and yet utterly lacking the soulful echo that turns sound into symphony. And now, Carlotta, amidst the murmur of the crowd and the shadow of the stage, where does your soul hide? Is it lost in the vanity of your reflection or drowned out by the hollow echo of your own ambition? Voices that truly stir the soul do not merely perform, they bleed truth, they breathe life into tales that echo through the ages. But you, Carlotta, stand on the precipice where artifice meets art. The stage calls not for the echo of a voice, but for the depth of a spirit. 
The limelight thirsts for more than your voice, Carlotta. It seeks a soul. As you step into its embrace, may you find not just the adulation you crave, but the truth you've long evaded. With a fleeting glance at her reflection, Carlotta's momentary pause betrays a crack in her veneer, a silent acknowledgement of the void within. The stage awaits, Carlotta. May it be a mirror not of your vanity, but a revelation of the soul you so lack. Monsieur Richard bursts into the dimly lit office, his visage a storm of indignation. Monsieur Moncharmin trails behind, the picture of composure amidst the brewing tempest. The door swings open once more to admit Monsieur Remy, who approaches with an evening paper in hand. Look at this affront, Debienne and Poligny's words, twisted into daggers, aimed at our backs. He points to the headline, its bold letters mocking them from the page. New management, a puppet show at the opera. Below the article paints a caricature of their leadership, comparing their decisions to the whimsical fancies of uh, inept puppeteers. Is this Le Fantôme's spectre, or merely the ghosts of our predecessors haunting us through the press? This is no phantom's doing. It's a clear jab from Debienne and Poligny, undermining us with veiled threats and public ridicule. Before Montcharmin can reply, La Sorelli, like a gust of wind, bursts into the room, her urgency undeniable. Monsieur, the Comte de Chagny's once keen interest in Mademoiselle Daae seems to have dimmed, yet the Vicomte remains utterly bewitched. Oh, I knew I could count on you. So, what of the murmurs of conspiracy against La Calotta? A mere whisper of rebellion, yet let us tread lightly. This plot, if there is one, does not come from de Chagny. Now, please do not repeat any of this. The Comte's favor, once withdrawn, is a chasm, vast and deep. In the wake of whispered plots and the rustle of scandalous newsprint, Monsieur Richard and Monsieur Montchamin retreat from their office's cloistered confines. The air heavy with the promise of revelations guides them back to box five. As they thread through the opera's veins, the murmurs of the crowd blend with the distant orchestral hum, a prelude to the night's crescendo. The office is now quiet, shrouded in the shadows of the evening. Papers are strewn about the desk, evidence of the day's chaos. But Monsieur Remy, the private secretary, is tidying up when he discovers the envelope from Carlotta's dressing room. Monsieur le directeur, you have made your position clear to me, and now, here is my reply. Consider this a formal declaration. You have ignored my warnings, transgressed my rules, and now you will bear the burden of your arrogance. This is not merely an act of rebellion, but a cry of war. Merde! Attendez-vous! Expect my shadow to hover over every corner of this opera house, over every note of music. This place is mine, and you will learn to fear le fantôme. This means war? Le fantôme de l'opéra. As Monsieur Rémy passes the phantom's missive, the script's sinister cadence casts a shadow across his soul. Each word, a harbinger of the storm to come, weaves an intricate dance of foreboding and intrigue. The office, once a haven of order, now echoes with the silent whispers of war declared in ink and ire. The grand foyer of the Paris Opera House is alight with the glitter of the elite and the hum of a thousand conversations. Amidst this tapestry of Parisian splendor, 
Our Monsieur Remy moves with urgency, a note clutched in his hand, bearing the Phantom's grave declaration. I must find Monsieur Montcharmin and Monsieur Richard. This warning cannot wait. He weaves through the crowd, each encounter a fleeting vignette against the backdrop of his dire mission. Remy bumps into Megjeri, who's animatedly recounting her tale to a captivated audience. And so, we rallied, every dancer contributing to free Mama from that unjust fate. Monsieur Richard is a bully. Forgive my haste, Mademoiselle Jury. The matter I attend to is urgent. He runs into the other members of the corps de ballet, all brandishing stolen props. With these weapons, we stand ready to face the malediction d'un étranger fantôme. If only our troubles could be warded off so easily with prop pitchforks. Monsieur le Comte, have you seen the managers? It's urgent. Alas, I have not. My concerns tonight lie elsewhere. Remy, nodding in understanding, continues his search, passing by the Vicomte, who barely acknowledges the world around him, lost in his silent longing for Christine. As Remy's search grows more desperate, the intermission draws to a close. The crowd begins to thin, filtering back to their seats, yet the managers remain elusive, the notes warning burning ever more urgent in Remy's grasp. across. The Comte de Chagny? Yes, the Comte de Chagny recommended her, and his brother, the Vicomte, is there next to him. He looks ill. He should be in bed, resting. The whole room seems fascinated by the new ambassador of Persia. And the Persian? They're watching to see if the ambassador observes the Persian. The Persian, a living enigma, was at the center of everyone's attention Dressed in traditional Persian attire, he contrasted sharply with the ambassador, who wore the latest Parisian fashion. The Persian's mysterious presence, his dark, melancholic eyes, and his silence only added to the intrigue. Not a bad night for a house with a curse upon it, eh? My God! Look at that fat lady in black, flanked by those two rough men down there in the center of the auditorium. Who do they belong to? Ha! Those people, my dear fellow, are my concierge, her brother, and her husband. Did you give them tickets? Yes, it's her first time at the opera, and she's replacing old Madame Giry. Let's see if Box 5 keeps up its reputation with her around. As the garden scene transitions, the aura of the opera house shifts subtly, the music and applause fading into the background. Raoul, his heart heavy with unspoken words, and unresolved feelings withdraws into the shadows of his box. In the dim light, Raoul unfolds a letter, its edges worn from being read and re-read. The words penned with a delicate hand speak volumes of a bond strained by unseen forces. My dear former childhood friend, you must have the courage not to see me again and not to speak to me anymore. If you love me even just a little, do this for me. For me, your little friend, who will never forget you. My dear Raoul, above all, never enter my dressing room again. Both our lives depend upon it. Your little Christine. The letter falls from Raoul's hands its message echoing in the silence. The weight of Christine's words, a mix of affection and warning, leaves Raoul torn between his desire to reach out to her and the fear of the unknown dangers she alludes to. Ah, Christine, my Christine. In this vast sea of art and illusion, you shine with a light that pierces the very depths of my soul. How cruel that amidst this splendor I find myself ensnared in the thorns of unrequited love, my desires whispered into the void, unheard. 
unseen. Each night, I stand here, cloaked in the shadows, a spectator to your radiance. Your voice, a melody that haunts my dreams, beckons me. Yet I remain a memory in your world, invisible, intangible. The agony of your indifference, sharper than the sting of rejection, leaves me adrift in a sea of my own making. And then there's Philippe, my brother, the Comte. His interference, well-intentioned perhaps, feels like chains binding me to silence. Does he not see? Does he not understand the fire you've ignited within me? His disapproval, a gale that threatens to extinguish the very flame he seeks to protect. Yet, as I hear your voice, a beacon in the night, I can't help but wonder. Do you sing for me, Christine? Is there a message woven within the tapestry of your song, a thread of hope for me to cling to? Or am I merely a fool, chasing after the light of a star too distant, too luminous? Philippe watches, his gaze heavy with judgment, a silent sentinel to my despair. He knows not the depths of this torrent that consumes me. But you, Christine, in the garden seen as Sibel, I saw it, a tremble, a hesitation. Was it a reflection of your own turmoil, a mirror to my soul's unrest? I can no longer remain a memory in your garden of song, Christine. This chasm that divides us, this gulf of silence and secrets, I must bridge it, lest I succumb to the tempest within. Oscar, the house lights dim and a hush falls over the expectant crowd. Tonight, the opera's jewel, Carlotta, takes the stage, her voice the beacon of the grand establishment. Thank <laughs> you. 
chandelier, a symbol of the opera's grandeur, becomes an instrument of chaos, its descent a terrifying ballet of destruction. chandelier had crashed down on the head of an unfortunate woman who had come to the opera that very evening for the first time, on the woman whom Monsieur Richard had appointed to replace Madame Giry in her role as usher and as the phantom's box keeper. But she was instantly killed on the spot, and the next day a newspaper appeared with this headline, 200,000 kilos on the head of a concierge. It was her only eulogy. Christine's been avoiding me. And then, this strange letter, I just wanted to see her, to understand why. Now, here I am, waiting outside her dressing room, hoping for a mere glance. A gentleman's place is certainly not within the confines of a lady's dressing room. Yet, here I am, compelled by necessity and a curious twist of fate. I remember, the first time I stepped into this sanctuary of hers, my eyes briefly caught sight of a modest lavatory tucked behind a velvet curtain. An unusual feature, perhaps, but in this moment, a most convenient one. And the door is not locked. That initial visit to Christine's dressing room left Raoul with a small impression of Christine's world here within the opera. A world filled with her dreams, her fears, and now, it seems, her unseen protector. Little did the young Vicomte know that small detail, a lavatory of all things, would serve as an unintended refuge in a moment of unforeseen chaos. What's that noise? Part of the performance, perhaps? No, it's growing louder, more frantic. Something's amiss. That's no part of any opera I know. What on earth is happening out there? Amidst the grandeur of the Paris Opera House, a scene of profound distress unfolds, hidden from the world, but exposed to the heart. Christine, she's here and she's terrified. What's frightened her so I should reveal myself, comfort her? But she's so distressed. Perhaps it's best I stay hidden just for a moment to understand. escape me, foreign and fraught with terror. What tragedy speaks in her cries? What fear drives her to such despair?
Lazarus. There's no one else here. How is that possible? As the last echo of Christine's departure faded into the heavy air of the dressing room, the silence that ensued seemed to thicken, punctuated only by the distant muffled sounds of the opera house beyond Raoul, emerging from the lavatory, separated by nothing but a thin curtain from the room where Christine had stood mere moments before, found himself stepping into a space that felt abruptly emptied of life. The mirror reflected a scene of bewildering normalcy, betraying no hint of the extraordinary passage it had just concealed. Raoul, his heart pounding with a mix of confusion and dread, called out Christine's name, his voice sounding strangely hollow in the suddenly stagnant air. Christine? Christine? The gaslight flickered, casting eerie shadows that seemed to dance, mockingly at his growing despair. The room, once a cocoon of warmth and intimacy, now felt like a cold, mocking stage set for a play whose plot had twisted unexpectedly into the realms of the unfathomable. Raoul's mind raced, trying to piece together the puzzle, to make sense of the impossible. The memory of Christine's last look, that fleeting mixture of rapture and resolve, haunted him. His thoughts were a tumult of questions with no answers, a maze with no way out. And then, the realization hit him like a physical blow. She was gone, vanished into the very air. And with her, a part of his world seemed to have slipped away leaving a void filled with shadows and whispers of a truth too strange to comprehend. <laughs> 